My name's Arsh uh, I'm online tonight with good friend and business partner, uh, Carol Cooney. Carol, can you hear me? Uh, good evening, Arsh. Good evening, everybody. Ah, brilliant. Okay, so we've got Carol. Carol's online, so um, we've got quite a few people online. So the one thing that I'd like everyone to do, if possible, just give us a quick hello. And also that you could tell us if you can hear us nice and loudly and clearly. That would be great. Uh, so let's just quickly work. Yeah, okay. So Harry says hello. Just let if you can let us know. Just make sure that you can hear us nice and clearly. Okay, brilliant. Mike says yeah. Hi, hi, Mike. Hi, Brian. Uh, hi, Irfan. Um, so we've got a lot of people online. Right. Okay. So tonight we're going to be talking about a topic which I'm assuming quite a few are going to be intrigued about because tonight we're going to be talking, giving you a real life example as to how Carol makes £30,000 a year managing just one property that she doesn't own. And the strategy that we're going to be discussing tonight is one called service accommodation. Now for those that are online at the moment, can you tell me, uh, what do you know about service accommodation? Do you know a lot about service accommodation? Do you, lot, do you not know anything about service accommodation? Is it something that's completely new to you? Uh, you know, what is it that you're looking to achieve out of it? Or are you just merely here just to try and figure out how Carol is making £30,000 on one property, which is equivalent to £2,500 a month? So if you wouldn't mind just giving me a quick heads up as to your experience, because then what we can do is we can tailor this uh, webinar completely to the people that we've got online. So, okay, so whilst we're waiting on those, we'll just give you uh, just a brief intro. So, first of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for trusting Carol and I with your time this evening, because we appreciate that time is the most precious commodity. And I personally guarantee that this is going to be one of the best investments that you're going to make. Because in just under 90 minutes, you're going to learn how to use a simple four-step model to enjoy a £30,000 a year income managing just one property. Uh, and also, you're going to be shown how to explosively increase your portfolio by using some of the growth secrets so that you can control five properties in a year without having to quit your day job. So, okay, so just quickly going through. <coughs> okay. So uh, quite a few people have got very little knowledge of it. Okay, uh, and Sam's come in and says, I've done some training, difficult finding a head lease permission, it's got to ensure costs are under control. Okay, and Mike says, hey, he's heard of it, but no, doesn't know much about it in great detail. Can it be used with the rent-to-rent -rent strategy? Okay, brilliant, right. So just a little bit about me. Why should you listen to me? Well, first of all, my name's Arshad Ahi, and I'm the best-selling author of a book called Boom, Bust, and Back Again. I've been involved in property full time uh, since the age, of, young age of 20. I'm now 30. Uh, sorry, well, 35, nearly 36. So 16 years full time. So you could say I'm a bit of a veteran. I run a group of property uh, letting agencies across the country. They call Rent Me Now, and I'm a franchisor for the agency. And uh, finally, I'm a property investor trainer and also a property mentor that has helped hundreds, if not thousands, of people that are hungry for change to achieve financial freedom. Now, who is Carol Cooney? Now, Carol, would you mind giving us a, a brief intro? Who are you? What, what is it that you do? And what's brought you to where you are today? Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I've been in the hotel, pub, nightclub trade for 30 odd years from a very young age until about seven or eight years ago. Um, then I was suddenly out of a job because we'd sold our last pub and the pub trade is pretty dismal all over the UK at the moment. So I was working in an office, a call centre for a while, uh, Curry's customer complaints. So you can imagine what that's like, a lot of irate customers. And uh, I met another guy who was involved in property and he encouraged me to get involved in property. So I have been a full-time landlord for the past five, six years. But only about two years ago, I started proper property training, and um, I've done some sales and things like that within property. I've got a few properties of my own, um, and uh, got into service about 15 months ago because um, obviously it dovetails beautifully with my um, hospitality background. Okay, fantastic. So 
as Carol said, she's got a bit of a hospitality background. But now, Carol, uh, you don't need a hospitality background to do this, do you? You just need uh, no, a lot no, of... not not at all, not at all. So all you need is the ability and a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, should we say is it enthusiasm the right word or yeah enthusiasm and you know be ready to spot an opportunity. Um, I'm always looking out for new challenges and I can see an opportunity in everything. And if you've got that mindset already, you'll you'll get where you want to be. Okay, so perfect. So what we're going to do, because quite a few of you have said that you've got no knowledge of service accommodation at the moment, um, what we're, we're going to start from the very beginning. So what is service accommodation? Because pretty much it's the highest cash flow uh, property management. And the beauty of service accommodation is, is that you don't actually have to own the asset uh, to be able to control the asset. Now, for those that are online, you may know of a strategy called rent to rent. And you could very easily rent a property off a landlord or existing landlord, and you could very easily turn that into service accommodation unit. And now that's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight because Carol has done exactly that. Now, Carol, did you buy the property that you, we're going to talk about tonight? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> no, okay, I got so, them all for rent to rent. So you've got them all on rent to rent, and then on yeah. that basis, how much have you paid for them? Or uh, did you pay a deposit on any of them or not? No, I didn't pay anything for them because um, I have a management agreement uh, with my landlord, and I literally, I didn't pay deposits or anything else. I literally just pay my rent once a month. Okay, fantastic. So tonight, Carol's going to be showing you about how to. Well, we'll be talking briefly about how to acquire properties from landlords, where to find them, but more importantly, how to turn them into a service accommodation unit. Now, the beauty about service accommodation is that previously, for rent to rent, you would have had to have taken on a three or four or five bedroom house to turn it into a decent cash flowing kind of uh, HMO. Now, with service accommodation, the beauty of it is, is that you don't have to take on a house. You can very easily take on an apartment um, very easily take an apartment um, and actually work off the back of that. So city centre apartments, and just give you an example, places like Liverpool where there's a glut of apartments all around the city, you can actually take great advantage of some of those empty apartments and turn them into service accommodation units. Now, Carol is actually based in Cambridge. And what can you tell us about Cambridge, Carol? Oh, well, Cambridge is the perfect storm because um, it's got uh, the Science Park, which is the UK's answer to Silicon Valley. Um, so there's lots of people traveling to and from work and all the various companies that are there. There's the hospital, which is a large hospital. Then, of course, there's the university. And then on top of all of that, uh, there's a big arts and theater type uh, society or uh, places to go do and see on that score. And uh, last of all, um, it's a beautiful city, and uh, you get tourists there all year round. Okay. So I suppose that's one of your first tips. First of all, you've got to figure out what is the attraction to your town or city. Would you agree? Because if you've got, if you live in the middle of nowhere and no one visits it, you've got to figure out is there going to be sufficient demand. And that's one thing that we'll talk about a little later on. And the beauty with service accommodation is that you can rent a house from a landlord. You can then either rent the house or a room by the night to the customer, not the tenant. Now, here's the massive difference. Because when you rent, when you're creating an HMO, what you're creating, technically speaking, is a place for tenants to live. Now, when you're creating a service accommodation unit, you're actually attracting customers. Now, you could say that tenants and customers are the same thing, but in actual fact, they're not, because a tenant may pay the rent in advance for a month. A customer can rent the room for the night, pretty much like you do in a hotel. Now, just imagine that you're going away for a weekend. Let's say that you're going, I don't know where, but you guys are based. Let's say that you're going away for a weekend in Blackpool. Now, you're not going to go and pay for a month to stop in that below you, what you're going to be doing is that you're going to be booking a hotel for possibly one or two nights and you'll be stopping there for that period. And that's exactly what it is. Service accommodation is very similar to the hotel trade. 
you will be running similar, something similar to a BNB, but you may not be offering all the facilities of the BNB. You may not be co offering cooked breakfast. You may not be offering all the linen facilities. There are lots of similarities, but equally, there can be quite quite far in. Um, they can be quite far as well. It's like running a BNB, as Paul would say. But like I said, you you're not going to be offering uh, food facilities. That's unless you want to. Now, Carol, in all your service accommodation units, do you actually offer any food? No. No, there's no need to. Not in service. Okay, perfect. Right, so moving on. So is it really the best management system we've got to ask? Because service accommodation will allow you to make more than twice than what you would on a normal HMO. It will allow you to make three times more than what you would on a rent to rent, and it will allow you to make ten times more than what you would on a single rent. Now, here's the beauty of it is because you don't own the asset, and you will you, hopefully you won't, you'll never need to own the asset. There's no mortgage to pay, or when I say no mortgage, you won't have a mortgage on the property because you don't own it. There'll be no solicitors, there'll be no uh, surveyors, there'll be, you know, it's a relatively straightforward transaction. Which means that you're, all you're doing is you're taking the property of the landlord, but you're maximising on your return. Now, just giving you a quick example. Here's a couple of things that we need to take into consideration for service accommodation. First thing is obviously the landlord's rent. So let's, for, for this example, use an example of a thousand pounds a month. Now, the biggest thing with service accommodation is understanding your break-even point, and not many people break home. Uh, you know, really go to town on this because for me, the way that you got to look at it, it, it is a business. Service accommodation is a business, and the one thing that you've got to understand is that you've got lots of outgoings. So let's just say that you've got your rent outgoing. Now you you may have some costs, like for argument's sake, linen, cleaning. Uh, you might even have staff. There may be some fees from some of the service providers that we're going to be talking about a little later on. And let's say that that's a thousand pounds a month. Now on the basis. Of there being a 65% occupancy rate, now that may mean that you're going to have, let's say, uh, I want to, I'm just trying to think how my calculations are here. One, two, three, four. Uh, so you're going to make a, a profit on occupancy rate of around 65%. Now, here's what I'm going to show you. Now, it's very easy, kind of, to understand from day one what your ad goes are. Now, the one thing I'm going to show you is that. There's lots of things that we'll be talking about a little later on. So all the bills, so council tax, water rates, TV license, wages, water, food, rent, um, booking.com, utility warehouse, world pay. And then obviously you've got to kind of figure out what your expectations are on your income. So uh, someone's just said, can we increase the size? And we can do that. So for argument's sake, first of all, you've got to figure out uh, What's your room rate per night? Now, you've got to have a look at what your competition's doing. How does that, how does that compare? Because remember, what you're competing against is all the other hotels in that location. So they're charging you £50 a night and you're charging £80 a night. You've obviously got to filter what you're offering so much better than what the hotels are. But the one thing that you can offer is that whereas they're probably just offering the room, you're offering the whole apartment or even a room in an apartment. Does that make sense? And then on the back of that, you have a look at what they're charging, and then you can calculate on the inclusive of all the. Now, here's a spreadsheet that I've created specifically for service accommodation. On the basis of all these figures here, you can kind of calculate at what point does it stop? Do you stop make, uh, start making money? Does that make sense? And that's something that we'll be talking about in a short while. <coughs> So the reason why, I'm just going to give you some national statistics before Carol starts working really on the meat of the presentation. Now, why don't you claim your share of £121 billion pie? Now, last year, uh, there was 20, uh, 21 million tourists that took a holiday in the UK. Now, the tourism is equivalent to 7.1% of the UK's economy, which means that it's, it's a massive market. And the average Brit now takes four holidays a year, which calculates as two weekend breaks, one week holiday, and two week holidays. Not all will be abroad. Now you've got to remember with the with this beautiful thing called Brexit, 
obviously the uh, the euro has become stronger, which means that it's going to be more expensive to go abroad. As a result of that, people may not be able to go abroad now. If you look at the exchange rate of the currency, it's pretty much one on one. Now, a friend of mine went and changed 100 euros today, and he actually had to pay 111 pounds for 100 euro. Uh, sorry, that's about pounds for 100 euros. So it's showing you what kind of strength the euro has got, which means that not everyone's going to be able to go to uh, afford to go abroad. Which means that more and more people are going to look to stay and holiday in the UK. Which the one thing that you uh, we found is that in 2012, 80% of the accommodation was booked online. Which means that the travel agents have become a thing of the past. Now that you've got to ask yourself is how did they book? Did they book on their mobile or on their computer? Because one of the biggest or one of the biggest websites that you'll require for service.com is a website called booking.com. And they spent approximately $2.8 billion on advertising in 2015 alone. And they are known to be Google's biggest advertising customer. Now this, you might be thinking, well, why am I telling you all this? Because this is all relevant to service conversion. Because if you were to go out and try and do this yourself, when I say do it yourself, try and advertise your property on your own portal yourself, it could be bloody expensive. Because could you imagine spending the best part of that kind of money on advertising? Or if you only spent 100 or 200 pounds on advertising, you would never get nowhere near the top rankings on Google. And Booking.com are currently spending 30% of revenue on advertising. So as a great saying goes, if you can't beat them, join them. So now, they obviously, they opened up to uh, landlords and investors like yourself who are interested in the service accommodation, uh, let's call it fertility, uh, fraternity, should I say, uh, and they've allowed people to now start advertising their properties on there, pretty much like, right, well, you can't advertise your properties if you're on, on right move, but pretty much like a gum tree for service accommodation, and it works extremely well. You get to do it all, so you get to upload it, you get to, to well, you, uh, the bookings come in, you get to control it, you get to answer it. Pretty much, uh, the best way of describing it is like eBay. When you upload your thing, if you, when you upload your product on eBay, people will look at it, if they like it, they will bid on it, if they don't, they may ask some questions. It's pretty much the same interaction. Now, the other one is Airbnb. Now, last year, Nearly a million tourists use Airbnb just to visit London each year. And Airbnb gave the London economy approximately £1.3 billion. Pounds. Airbnb suggests that guests stayed on average 4.6 nights compared to 3.1 for typical visitors to the UK. So it's showing you that there's a massive market for the tourist market. And Airbnb is creating a door to an open world bringing tourists to neighbourhoods they had met previously had missed. And that's a quote from the Airbnb co-founder, uh, Brian Chesky. More and more people are earning the extra money they need to pay their bills or pursue their dreams. Because, remember, what you could do is that if you're living in your own house, you could even rent out, well, when I say rent out, you could even offer your spare rooms on Airbnb. And I know so many people that were doing that. And it's allowing them to make further, uh, allowing them to make some cash flow from the property that they're also living in. And here's one of the cherry, cherry on the top, cherry on the top. If that makes sense. George Osborne, although he despises landlords, he loves entrepreneurs. And from 2017, the first thousand pound, you won't have to declare any of your tax, so you can earn. Uh, so you'd have to pay or pay the tax on the first thousand pounds that you earn. So I'm going to pretty much shut up now because what I want to do, I want to pass on to Carol, who's going to be showing you, uh, taking you through the steps that she's done to maximise all the returns on her service accommodation units. Feel free to ask questions, and I'll try and put a, a put in as and where we can. But this is your opportunity, guys. So. Feel free to make most of it. So, Carol, what's the steps? So, first of all, I don't think these are actually in the same order. So, the first one, let's quickly see if we can find. Ah, okay. 
So the first one is find, Carol. Where do we find them? Um, you find them on Gumtree. Um, you, you're basically looking for landlords, so you could do um, a, um, hey, uh, a job mail campaign to your local HMO landlords list that you can get from your local council. Uh, look on Gumtree, look in the papers, look on Right Move, see Open Rent, some of those, see what houses are to rent. For example, if you look on Open Rent, um, that's a tenant based website, but you can always ask the landlord, uh, I saw your advert, have you got any more? Um, so those are the type of places that you would look. You can even place an advert on Gumtree free of charge or in your local paper saying um, we're a corporate relocations agency, we're looking for uh, houses in the area. Uh, and then if you get a response from your landlord, uh, or you would be landlord, you can kind of say, well, uh, we want to do serviced. Okay. Uh, now, the beauty with it is, obviously, we've talked about rent to rent. And the beauty is that um, you can find properties very easily. Now, all you've got to do is find a landlord that's got a void. Uh, and how did you find yours, Carol? You know, how long have you been running your rent to rent uh, how did you find the properties, or are you still taking more properties on? I am, yeah. I've got uh, two or three in the pipeline at the moment uh, because obviously um, I'm going to maximise to 10 in Cambridge, and uh, then I'll leave Cambridge out of it at that point. I'll just carry on with what I'm doing there because Peterborough is my next port of call. Uh, but I found my landlord um, on my first stock mail campaign. And uh, the five I currently have with him, they're all with him. So because of that, I've not had to look for any more, to be very honest about it. And then okay. one of the guys that sold one of his houses and bought another one on the same street of one that he's got, he rang me up the other day and said, um, I'm going to New Zealand to work for three years. Will you look after the house for me? You can do what you were doing with those others. I said, yeah, no bother. So that's going live in December. And uh, then I was speaking to another landlord the other day whom I found on Gumtree. Um, he's having difficulty uh, letting it out as a rent to rent in Cambridge at the prices that he wants for it. Uh, so I've kind of persuaded him to drop the price a bit for a start because he had all these insurances and um, um, uh, internet Wi-Fi and all that type of thing. And I said to him, well, you don't need to do any of that because we'll do that, but we, you know, we need a, a proper market rent or below. So we're still discussing that, but he's very intrigued with what I'm doing. And um, also um, we're thinking he's got loads of properties in St. Nates, uh, which is a fairly big town between Cambridge and, and Peterborough. And uh, so I'm having a meeting with him next week to see what we can do together for service for, for the future. Okay, fantastic. So we've talked about fine. Now, fine, what happens when you take control of Carol? Uh, well, what you do is, uh, which I've actually got one, um, you um, sign a man management agreement with the landlord. It can be, you can change the management agreement around. It can be three, five, seven years. Um, to be honest, I'd probably go for a three to five years just to see how it goes. However, we will talk about that later, but if you pick the location right, uh, and there's different types of SA models as well, uh, if you pick the location right, um, and do all your due diligence, you should actually know uh, that you're in with a good chance of having profit all the time uh, because service is getting so big now. But um, yeah, I just signed a management agreement with them um, saying that I'd take care of all small maintenance jobs, uh, all the bills such as the broadband, etc., and pay them an agreed sum rent every month. Okay, fine. Now, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to start moving on to furnishing now because obviously we need to figure out, you know, if you're going to do this, how is it that you furnish them? Uh, because what you need to do, you need to create a home from home. And this is a beauty with it. Because when you go to stop in a hotel, technically speaking, let's just choose Premier, uh, Premier Inn as an example. You know what to expect. You're going to walk into a room, you're going to see a big bed with a big purple, big purple, um, what's the thing that they put on the end of the bed? Red, uh, bed throw, spread. Throw. You're going to get a big purple throw on the end of the bed. You're going to have a couple of pillows, you're going to have, um, and there's going to be a TV on the wall, and there's going to be uh, pretty much a remote control, and a little kettle, a couple of cups, and that's about it, and you've got your ensuite. 
Now, what with service accommodation, what you're doing is you're creating a home from home, which means that in each room, there's going to be stuff like a double bed, wardrobe, lounge chair or sofa, desk, ceiling light, door locks, curtains, artwork, and also possibly a safe. Now, uh, uh, for those that guys that we've got online, have you ever stopped in a service accommodation unit before? Uh, like fragments, if you've gone away for the weekend, what have you ever stopped in something like a service accommodation or service department? Because they're fantastic. Because what you're actually doing is that you're going away from your home and you're actually going into what, not someone else's home, but into another apartment that has been maintained to a great standard. And when you go to the kitchen, the beauty of the service accommodation and the reason why I like service accommodation when I go away is purely because when I leave my house, I don't want to have to go to somewhere like a Premier Inn and go to the restaurant because uh, if I'm honest, especially if you're going, if you're working away, etc., prefer to have a kitchen work and either take some food or uh, make some food and it is feeling like home from home. So most of the kitchens will have stuff like cutlery, crockery, pots and pans cups and glasses, washing machine, a dishwasher, and a fridge. Now, the great example for this is Centre Parks. Now, has anyone actually been to Centre Parks? And have you ever stopped in any of the log cabins? Because that is a perfect example of service accommodation. You leave your home, you, turn, and you probably pack some food, as well as you buy a kid's bikes and all your clothes, and you get to Centre Parks, you park outside the log cabin, and you offload and you do exactly, and that is, you know, to be fair, I don't know why I've never used that example before, but Centre Parks is a perfect example of service accommodation. It's uh, the only difference being is that they're in a remote location, so they're pretty much creating their own community. Whereas what we're asking here, or what we're talking about tonight, is partic uh, particularly apartments or accommodation in your location. Now, in in the living room. There would be stuff like you wouldn't expect your guests to bring a big TV with them or a sofa with them because obviously these are things that you should be providing because that's what they're going to be paying the money for. Now, service accommodation is generally more expensive than hotels, but you're offering a lot more. You're offering luxury, you're offer, offering fully furnished accommodation, clean, uh, a, a clean and safe environment, and you're not living in almost like one big hostel as you would with a big hotel. So you've got a big TV, two sofas, dining room. You'll possibly even be offering Wi-Fi, and something that um, Carol's going to be talking about, which is the money maximizer. So I'm going to just quickly tell you about something that Carol and I are running. We're doing this as a bit of an experiment because we're running a full day's training on the 29th of October. We should be talking you through exactly what to do in each of the steps so that you can set up your first combination quickly. So I'm just going to mention that and how off one property you can make just under two and a half grand a month by using this simple system. And we'll be showing you how to how to keep your occupancy rates up where Carol currently enjoys around 98% occupancy all, all year round as opposed to 65%. And how to become a property entrepreneur, not a cleaner, because remember a big part of it is systems. Last thing you want to do is be sitting there checking guests in, checking guests out, because you want to be working on Building the business and managing and uh, managing a reliable, hard-working and loyal team. Now, the other thing that we'll be looking at is how to really integrate Booking.com into your systems and how to use some of some of the other channel managers to make sure that they're working for you so that you're not working as hard. So, how to play their rules so that you can profit from their marketplace and how to make your adverts stand out in a crowded marketplace. You've got to imagine that when you're when you're advertising your place, you're going to be pretty much like a room on spare room. It's going to be it's going to be shadowed by about a thousand other adverts. What is it that you need to put in there to get your place booked? So Carol will be going through that. We'll be showing you all the other uh, booking sites. So Booking.com and Airbnb, just one of them. How many sites do you uh, advertise on, Carol? Um, I'm on about 10 or 12 of the major ones, including the two you've just mentioned, plus Hotels.com, Late Rooms, Expedia, uh, TripAdvisor, uh, that and plus some local ones. Okay. 
One thing that Carol's going to be talking to you about is also the five-minute video that saves you hundreds of late-night calls and gives you customers a bit experience. Because one person, I think, uh, there, I'm just going to have a quick look. Someone's asked, but how much time does this entail? Because if you create the documents on day one and you tell your customers exactly what to expect before they get there, they won't need to call you. An example, the one that Carol has got around is she's created almost like a five-minute video of all the things to expect when she when they reach that apartment. So, for argument say, could be this is where the key is kept. This is how to operate the dishwasher. This is how to operate the washing machine. This is where you should leave the key. Or this is where you put the dirty linen. So and so forth. Because these are things that generally you could either put in a manual format or a video format. And Carol's decided to do it in a video because you can send the video prior to guests arriving so they know what to expect. So uh, the investment is 997, but don't worry, we're not going to be talking about that. Now, Carol, filling the rooms, what are the best sites? Which is best? Um, without a doubt, in, in my area, Booking.com, um, Airbnb are quite good in larger cities like London, but they're not known as well in more regional parts of the UK. But I have to say, Booking.com is the main man right across the board. It's the biggest uh, booking website in the world. Okay, perfect. Now, now Carol, this uh, something to say. Here's something for everyone to take into consideration. Is that now Carol decides to book by by the room by the night. Now just imagine you've got a five bed HMO. Now she rents out how much are the average rents in your location, Carol? Um well I charge for my El Cheaper rooms I charge forty per night. Um and for my more expensive rooms eighty. Okay. Uh, and then on the weekend you do a special, on a Sunday you do a special discount just to keep the room occupied, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, I do, I do half price on a Sunday. Um, about a year ago I actually thought people didn't move around on a Sunday night. Um, as soon as I slashed my prices I realised exactly how much people do move around on a Sunday night. And uh, my new Sunday night trick has definitely increased my take. When I compare this year's figures with last year's figures, you know, there's a big, big increase. Sunday is my busiest night of the week now. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, Carol's been a little bit strategic with her marketing, a little bit strategic with her pricing, and then it's full on a, otherwise what would be an otherwise dead night. Now, uh, she rents, now let's just say that she's got a two bedroom apartment. Now, if someone wants to take the whole apartment, that's great. But alternatively, if, Carol, if two individuals want to rent the rooms individually, that's also fine. And it would be more profitable to do that. I know there's lots of people that will only do like a three-night minimum. I know uh, other people like Carol that will do it by the room, by the night. So if someone only wants Thursday night, so be it. If someone wants it for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, even better. You know, you've got to look at what works for you in your location. Things that we've got to look at is... What events are happening in that location? Now, let's just say, for argument's sake, I know that um, some of the guys that I mentor, one of the, one of the guys, their location is Wembley. Now, what tourist attractions are there in Wembley? Now, if you can just give me a quick, rough idea as to what's in that area. And I can pretty much guarantee all the males will get this, ad, uh, will get this answer. <laughs> Straight away, Wembley Stadium. Now, Wembley Stadium, okay, all, everyone automatically assumes that Wembley Stadium only does football matches. But have you ever thought about all the concerts, all the corporate hospitality, and all the other events that they run? If you go onto Wembley Stadium's website, you'll see all the events that they run throughout the year. And pretty much, if you're in a good location and your price right, and the price is right, and the product is right, you're going to be booked all the way throughout the year. Now, Irfan has bought SSE. I'm assuming that's a corp. Uh, I'm assuming that's a corporate client. And the beauty of it is that with service accommodation, you can even get corporate clients. Now, let's just use an example. Is let's just say that in Wembley. Now, let's just imagine that they've got quite a lot of lights, or let's just say the seating in that location. Now, uh, okay, sorry, so SSE Arena. So. When these, um, when these workers or contractors come from out of town to Wembley to fix the seats, 
Are they all going to stop in hotels, or is that going to be quite expensive? Now, if you can offer something like a service accommodation where you may give them a slight discount, but they book it out for, say, three months, is that not ideal for you? And so you can do that. You can take on corporate clients with, uh, with service accommodation. Now, Carol, tell us about some of your management secrets. Because is it, is it, am I correct in assuming that you actually do very little? So all you do is you oversee the operation. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. I used to do all the work at the very beginning because I wanted to get my head around it, but that lasted about a week. Okay, fantastic. So now, who have you got? So you've got the cleaners, you've got washers uh, making the beds, and you've got people taking late night calls. Is that correct? Yeah, I have. Uh, my husband looks after all the domestic side. Um, he looks after the cleaners and uh, rotates them and so on and so forth. Um, he also oversees the laundry, but doesn't actually do it. Um, so that's all done. Uh, then the late night calls are handled by All Day PA, uh, and uh, I also have um, an assistant that does the uh, bookings and that because um, I find with the system I've got now, in order to do the bookings and process the bookings, a it only takes five seconds to do an individual booking because I have it all prepared already so it's just copy and paste um, and B you only need to check um, the bookings the um, Evivo or Elena uh, three or four times a day and uh, just see if anything's come in and if you already if you already know that you're full that day you certainly don't have to check because nobody's going to be able to book if you're full which I am obviously most of the time and that's the great thing about service accommodation because it is very much systems led you can't have people over booking. So for argument's sake, now Carol said that she advertises on twelve different websites. Now how would one website be able to uh, pretty much talk to the other websites that they don't book on the same night? So let's just say that Carol's now based in Cambridge, I'm based in Wolverhampton. Now Carol uh, Carol may be looking at one hotel, I may be looking at the same hotel for the same night. Now Carol books first automatically it blocks it out for me so that I can no longer book that room and or in that unless there's other rooms available there. And so there's systems in place that allow that not to happen. So it doesn't get double booked, which means that you don't get bad reviews. Now when you book a service to well let's say that you go away. When you look to go away, what is it that you look for? So let's say that you're going away abroad, you're looking for a hotel, what is it that sways your decision? Now, for me, and well, especially my wife, uh, the biggest thing that she will take advice on is the reviews, because the reviews will determine whether whether someone has had a good or bad experience at that location. Now, if it's all been good, if it's been quite positive, guess what? My wife will book it. Now, for I'm going to take Carol, now on your service accommodation business, how has uh, what's the reviews like on your uh, on your business there? Well, I was discussing reviews with another hotelier that also does service just this morning, and they said, you know, when somebody reads reviews and there's excellent reviews and your score is around 9.5, and then this bad review pops up in the middle, she pretty much hit the nail in the head. She says, doesn't that make that person look silly? Uh, because, yeah, we'll all get the odd bad review because you can't please everybody all of the time. But the point is, if the majority of your reviews are good, um, it means you've done your job well. And uh, people will judge by the fact that there's only been maybe one bad review and 50 good reviews. So that's not going to have any effect on, on the overall review score at all. OK, fantastic. So here's, here's one property now. Now, this is what you're here for, because obviously the whole title of the presentation is How Carol Makes £30,000 a year of a property that she doesn't own. Now, Carol, here's a property, Circus Drive in Cambridge, which is a property that, a uh, four bed property, uh, which you're currently renting off the landlord for £1,700 a month, is that correct? Correct. And, and you've got it uh, rented out, and you said, what the room rents per night? Oh, sorry, what the room rates per night? Uh, there's four rooms, one of which is an ensuite. Uh, the ensuite is 80 on a Saturday night. It's 65 during the week. 
my cheapest double is £40 a night, six nights a week. And as I said earlier, they're all half price on a Sunday night. Okay, perfect. So basically, and the cost, so when we talk about cost, Carol, what we're talking about, we're talking about broadband, we're talking about cleaners, we're talking about bed linen, we're talking about all the basic stuff, yeah? Yeah, all so, the basic stuff, plus your channel manager, your, uh, um, what's the word, uh, merchant account, your, uh, although with the Vivo channel manager, that's included. Um, even things like, uh, you know, I factor in the petrol and bits and pieces as well into that because, you know, you have to account for everything. Okay, so that takes into consideration stuff like tax, etc, etc. So, on the basis yeah. that the cost is around £1,630 a month, uh, after taking into consideration, well, the income of that property is £5,689 per calendar month. Now, take out the rent, take out the cost, it's leaving me in just short of two and a half thousand pounds a month, two thousand three hundred and fifty nine pounds a month. And that is pretty much a great product. Now for argument's sake, let's just use a smaller property. That's on of a four bed property. Now working on the on the basis the same kind of principle of a two bed property, that's easily going to be generated circa twelve hundred pounds a month. And where else can you get twelve hundred pound cash flow off an apartment? Now, uh, admittedly, the rent's not going to be as high. Admittedly, the costs aren't going to be as high. But there's still other things that you still got to take into consideration, stuff like booking.com fees, Airbnb, listing fees, etc. So there'll still be quite a few fees, but you know, by, by no means the utilities aren't going to be anywhere near as high. So there's lots, and the beauty of it is, uh, sorry, Carol, Mike has come up with a question straight away. Mm -hmm. He goes, is it four separate rooms with a communal bathroom, kitchen and living room? Yeah, um, apart from the ensuite, uh, which the name um, describes what it is, the other three rooms share the bathroom, the kitchen. Um, there was a big living room, we made that into a bedroom because there's a small one downstairs and that's a little study reading Wi-Fi room with a couple of chairs, TV, beanbag, that type of thing. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so hopefully that's answered it. And then Charles, how to choose a channel manager, what to look for. So uh, basically, Carol, do you want to just briefly touch on what is a channel manager? How can it help and how does it help the systemize business? Yeah, a channel manager is basically, as Arsh described earlier on, if he was in Wolverhampton and I was in Cambridge and we were similarly at the same time trying to book the one hotel space, we'll say in Wembley just for uh, an example, <clears throat> whichever of us books first gets that hotel room and that prevents the other person from getting it because it's by then already gone. So with the channel manager, because I'm on TripAdvisor and Late Rooms and Hotels.com and all the rest of them, that, that's all happened through the channel manager. So I do get the bulk of my work from Booking.com, but I also get bookings from all of them. And it all comes through the channel manager and it's pretty much first come, first served. So there's never any confusion and it all happens in real time as well. So there's never any confusion. <clears throat> you, excuse me, you don't get two guests fighting over a room because the channel manager organizes your calendar and it prevents that from happening. Okay, great. So uh, now here's a question now, Carol, because I know that um, a couple of people asked this question so far. So that what planning is required? Because I know that you've been through this, haven't you, Carol? Well, yeah. Um, that, that's quite funny because um, I phoned up our council and said, uh, do I need planning permission or do I need a license or I want to do this, what am I supposed to do? Um, I was advised to ring the planning department first and now I've also got emails from them, um, any correspondence we've had, I've kept that in case it's needed down the line. And the planning department said to me, hmm, I don't know, perhaps I should put you through to the fire department. I said, yeah, okay then, we'll, we'll, we'll do that because I have fire safety in, in the bigger ones anyway. Um, and the fire department said to me, well, gosh, Oh, uh, perhaps I should put you through to the environmental health officer. So um, I had uh, phone calls with all of them and uh, we've exchanged emails. The environmental health officer came out and gave me a five-star rating for the state of the kitchen. 
Um, and that's about it. It, it. There's nothing in place um, because it's a fairly new concept. A lot of councils uh, don't really know what to do with it yet, but <clears throat> it's good to keep your eye on it because um, councils won't, in the long run, won't uh, use, sorry, lose an opportunity to make money. So I'm sure they'll bring in some le some legislation fairly soon. Okay, that's that's interesting because the one thing is here is um, let's just quickly have a look at this. Now, uh, what one thing I want to touch upon is that. People, uh, someone's asked me that, can this work in an Article 4 area? Now, the beauty of it is, is yes, it can, because you're not running a HMO. Yeah. And the beauty of it is, is that you're not running it as, when you're not running it as a HMO, you're not offering six month tenancies, and people are booking by the night per room, which means that you aren't running a HMO because it's short term accommodation and not long term accommodation. So, places like Milton Keynes, so I know some people that are doing extremely well. In Milton Keynes, which is the Article 4 area, where they're taking two bed apartments and turn them into service accommodation. So, this is a great strategy. Now, Ramesh has asked, can we use rent to rent contracts for service accommodation? When you say that, are you talking about taking the property off the landlord? Because if that's the case, yes, you can use a management contract to take it off the landlord, but then obviously, any bookings that you do has to be done via a portal. Such as Booking.com or Airbnb, etc. Uh, and he go, he also asked the second question: For this property, do we pay the council tax or business rates? Uh, Carol, would it be fair to say that yeah. you only pay council tax? It's not business rates, is it? Um, yeah, you can apply for business rates um, on on a service with your local council. Now, I applied, and my council will only let me do one of the properties. The rest of them have to pay council tax on. But if you're only doing one property at that particular time in, in one area, shall we say, um, the council the rules on the councils vary from council to council to council slightly on this. But um, yeah, it's definitely a good move to apply for business rates because it's much cheaper than council tax. But in, in my case, at the moment, because they're all in Cambridge, I'm only paying business rates on one of them. The council won't is uh, making me pay council tax on the other four. Okay, so Carol, let's, uh, okay, so we'll come back to a few of the questions here. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to some of the questions because some questions with regards to headlines, some questions to do with mortgages, and we'll come back to those. Okay, because uh, someone's just asked that, about this. So, like Carol uh, and I mentioned earlier, we are running a service accommodation masterclass. It's on Saturday, the 29th of October in Birmingham. And what we'll be showing you how to do the full four, uh, four to five steps so that you can set up your first accommodation quickly. Showing you how to make two and a half thousand pounds managing just one property by simply not uh, by not owning it, which means that we'll be going through some of the rent to rent strategy so that I'm showing you how to acquire the property of the landlord. And uh, showing you how to get your occupancy rate up to around 98% so that you can make sure that you're making good money out of it. We'll be showing you how to become an entrepreneur and not a cleaner. So when we say that, we'll be showing you what to look for in a channel manager, how to work the channel manager, how to identify which area is a great location. So we'll be looking at your gold mining area as well. We'll be showing you about, remember, booking.com is the most important portal uh, that you will require for this strategy. So we'll be showing you exactly how to work it so that you can go out put the property on the very next day and how to make your advert stand out from a crowd in a crowded uh, marketplace. And remember, I said Carol is currently working on 12 portals. We'll be going through each and every one of them. And the final money maximizer. Now, when they're in your property, when they're in your accommodation, there's lots of things that you can actually sell them. So you could sell your customers additional benefits, how to do this, uh, what they want, and what makes most money. Now, Carol, when we send them money maximizer, what is it? What else do you sell them whilst they're there? Um, I assume you're asking me about the vending machines, Ash. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. You can put a vending machine in. Um, like I guess uh, it shows my pub background here to a certain point. We have fruit machines all the time. But uh, yeah, you can put a. You know, if you've got a big space in your hallway, you can put a big vending machine in, the same as you'd see in a gym or a sports centre. That would be selling all the energy drinks, uh, even crisps and nuts, 
obviously it's not a good idea to put sandwiches into a, um, a vending machine because they have a short shelf life and contravene some of the health and safety food laws. Um, but you can put things in like little tubes of toothpaste. Um, one thing that I got asked for a lot, um, which I have no idea where to find it because it's kind of in reverse, is my overseas guests asked me quite a lot for um, an English version of um, one of those converter plug things. Now I've got loads of the Spanish ones and the European ones, but I haven't got it in reverse. So if anyone could tell me where I could get some of those, I'd like to stop those in the vending machines, but all things like that. And if you have a smaller space, well, you can get one of those circular vending machines, um, the ones that dole out the chocolate coated peanuts and the, the graze snacks and all that kind of thing, although I would bolt it down with a chain, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, you could put those on a worktop type situation if you have a smaller space. Basically, you rent the vendor machine off the vending company, uh, you pay maybe £10 a month for the larger ones, they'll supply the stock, they'll let themselves in once a week or once a fortnight, they'll replenish the stock, and uh, basically um, they're selling it to you at one price, you're charging a, a different price, and uh, you pocket the difference. Okay, perfect. So Carol's pretty much an entrepreneur is there. Because she's shown that in actual fact you can maximise on the people now. For argument's sake, when they come to your pro when they're at the property, you could give them a special discount so that they book again. There's so many ways that you can monetize this strategy. And the key is here, so you're not getting called out left, right, and centre whilst they're in your property. If you provide that five minute video that saves you hundreds of late night calls and gives your customers a better experience. So this is a video that goes out to the customers. It's almost like a Bible. So have you ever been into service conversation or you have been into a hotel and they give you a guide? These are the things to look out for. These are the things that you want to be. Uh, these are the things that you want to be doing. This is what's in this location. Here's where the TV. Here's where the remote is. Da 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 da. And it basically gives the customer a better experience. How to do this? What to include? Where to host it? Because what we'll begin, we'll be giving you Carol's version of her Bible. Now, what's investment? Because I would say it's 997, but it's not going to be 97, 997, because what we're looking for is 10 individuals. Now, we've already got four individuals, so we're only after six people. Looking for a standout testimonial, people that can tell stories that will inspire other people to realize their dreams. Now, it's the first time that Carol and I are working on this workshop. Now, I've seen the content, and the content is phenomenal. We're doing it on Saturday, the 29th. Of October in Birmingham, and you can have it for six nine seven. So that's one day. So uh, what we what we are also doing is we're recording the day as well. And for those that can't make it, now uh, Sam has said, sorry, I can't make that date. Um, I, I can't make that date. What you can do is you can purchase the recording and all the associated documents. So in this offer, what we'll be giving you is the recording, you'll be getting Carol's documents that she uses on a day-to-day -day basis in her service accommodation, you'll be getting a five-minute video, you'll be getting the Bible, you'll be getting the rent-to-rent -rent management agreement so that you can go on and take this. That management agreement alone is worth £1,500. It costs me a lot of money to uh, create that management agreement so you can have that management agreement for free by attending the workshop. Now, uh, Charles Paul, I live in Malta. How can you help me start? Now, Charles, here's an opportunity because what you can do is uh, Carol may even be in a position where she'll be able to either help or even JV with you, depending on the location. So there's lots of opportunities here to work with an expert such as Carol. Now, Arabella has asked, how does the negotiation with the landlord work? How much discount on the listed rent would be reasonable? Does the three, five, seven year term fix with the rent or will there be rent increase? What notice period is normal, especially rele relevant if the property is not working? Now, Arabella, guess what? With rental rent and with service accommodation, the beauty of it is, is that this is all subject to negotiation. Now, let's just go back one step. If you were to purchase the property, there is no negotiation. The fact is, you own that property. The only way that you can get out is by selling the property. The 
Dealing with rent to rent and service accommodation, you dictate the terms. Yes, Mr. Landlord, I am willing to sell your property off you for the next seven years, but I may want a rent free period. I may not want to pay a deposit. I may want to only put in a break clause at month, year one, year three, year five. You dictate the terms. And these are the things that we'll be going through on the day. What to be looking out for? Because remember, the key thing is your break even point. At what point does this thing start making money? And once you've understood that, you will then be able to, once you've understood the calculator that we've got in place for this, you will then be able to determine, yes, I'm going to take this property on, or no, I think it's going to be too much of a risk. Does that make sense? So, Sam, just answering your question, yes, it is recorded, and you can't make the Saturday. It will be recorded, and you can, for those that are interested, uh, you can book by using this link at the bottom. It's called bit.ly forward slash SA, which stands for Service Convention, hyphen master, MC stands for Masterclass. And here's what I'm going to offer you. I'm actually <coughs> so confident that we've got the course content right that you can attend the course up until lunchtime, and if you're not completely and utterly satisfied, all you have to do is say, and I'll re give you a full refund, no questions asked, no hassles or forms to fill out, no problem at all. Because here's what you've got to do. So the location is at Birmingham in the West Midlands. Uh, the one thing that we will be doing is for those that can't attend in person, we'll give you one other option. You can even live stream the session from the comfort of your own home. Um, so, for I can say, at the moment, like you're watching a webinar now, you'll see my slides. What we'll be doing on the day, we'll be doing a live stream so that people can watch from the comfort of their own home, but they'll be seeing Carol present. You'll have all the documents before the event, which will be emailed to you, and then you will also get access to the recording as well. Everyone that comes on the workshop, whether you're there in person or whether you're there virtually, or whether you just want the recording, we'll get the recording and all the associated documents. The cost of the recording is exactly the same as being there because obviously it's, the value is in all the documents that you're going to be getting as well as the recording. So that link again is bit.ly forward slash sa hyphen mc. So we will walk you through your first deal. So for those that attend, we will help you find your first deal assess you, assess your first deal to make sure the numbers work and even show you how to get the deal funded if needs be. So I'm actually part of a crowdfunding platform called simpleequity.co.uk and I can show you how by finding your first deal we can actually get it funded so someone helps with the, someone helps get it funded uh, where you may have to give away a small percentage of their profit but isn't it better to have 50% of something as opposed to 100% of nothing. So these are a couple of things that we'll be going through. And you've got to ask yourself, what difference would this cash flow make to your life? Now, I don't know about you, but cash cash flow creates freedom. And when you've got freedom, there's so many things that you can do. You can spend more time with your family, you can go on more holidays, you can buy more cars, and the list goes on. Now, I'm going to put a bit of a data because what happens if you do nothing? Well, you know, first of all, thank you very much for your time, but you don't have to worry about learning anything new. You don't have to worry about taking action. You don't have to worry about getting out of your comfort zone, which also means that your life will not change. Because you've got to ask yourself, don't go to yourself to give it a try, because all it takes is a, a, day, of your, a day of your life, and it's next, uh, the next one is on the 29th of October, 2016. Now, if you're still thinking about it, remember you can attend in three different formats. Attending in person, which means that you get to also meet myself and Carol. You get to also live stream it, the whole, whole event from the company of your own home. You also get to purchase a recording of all the associated documents by securing your place tonight. Because you can do this. And I always put this up because if you're waiting for a sign, guess what guys? This is it. Now, you've obviously come on the webinar because it's intrigued you. I'd like to thank you very much for taking time to be on this webinar. Now, if you're smart, hungry, and motivated, you know what you need to do. You need to come and see us. Because if there are any other questions, I'm going to be available for the next 20 minutes or so. My mobile number, you've got my personal mobile number there. You can give me a quick call. You can have a chat, see how we can help. 
we can email it tomorrow at arch at archilahi.com. Uh, one person has just asked, can we put the link back up? This can do that. Bear with me a second. And whilst we're doing that, what I'd like to do is take some questions. Uh, sorry, they've just, ah, oh, what am I, what am I doing? So, are there any questions on the strategy? Uh, because here we go. So, uh, Mike has put, I live in Bristol, I think it would be perfect for this strategy. It has two universities, good industry, with Rolls Royce and Airbus factories with two big hospitals. To be fair, Mike, you've already identified all the industries in your location. All you've got to do now is find accommodation for them to live in. Does that make sense? Okay, so how do you find apartments without head lease restrictions? Now, uh, now, Carol, have you ever come across this? Have you ever had head lease restrictions? Um, so other people have. Uh, to be truthful, we've kind of avoided apartments, um, but uh, in some blocks of flats, um, there's some people operate in SA already. If that be the case, they've gone through all the hopes with councils and this, that, and the other. So it's a little bit easier. Um, some people, you, you know, other in, larger investors will buy a block of apartments, um, and they're the you, you, they own the whole building, so that's easier for them. To be honest, we stick with houses, uh, but apartments they can be done. There's more hoops to jump through, but it's not as bad as people make out. Carol? Yeah, Hello? can you hear me? Carol? Yeah, just lost you for a second. It's not as bad as people make yeah. it. So. Yeah, okay. no, what I was saying was there are a few hoops to jump through with apartments, with uh, neighbours and fire re regulations and things like that. Some people buy the whole block and they can get around a lot of that that way. There are a few hoops to jump through, but it's not as bad as people make it out to be. Okay, now uh, Sam has put but if not apartments, then isn't it difficult to get the right standard and isn't it more, more like a bed sit? Now, that's a good question to be fair, mate, because, um, because if, if the standard of the house is right, there's nothing wrong with people. And remember, you're not for this people that you're going to appeal to. You're going to appeal to people who are after simply cheap dicks. You're after people, you're going to be looking for contractors, you're going to be looking for tourists. Now you've got to remember, not everyone can afford to stop in a Hilton. Not everyone can afford to stop in a Ramada. There will be people that will be stopping at the Premier Traveling, but remember, they've only got access to a certain amount. Now, people will be happy to stay slightly out of the town for cheaper accommodation. So we'll go again, have a look at the rent that you're paying, and the rent that you're paying, the room rates that you're charging, and seeing how it can all work together. Now, Carol, what's your take on that? Because obviously you've got houses that does this. How do you find yeah, it with I, the house? Yeah, I've got houses and apartments. I've got two two bedroom as well in the five that I've got. And um, any of them can look as well as you want them to be. And um, you, I find that I've got every type of guest who's there to fill up every type, every size of apartment. Okay. Right, okay. So, uh, Mike says, what's, um, so, I'm sorry, I'm just going through some of the questions. Okay, so, Ramesh says, but what about new development apartments? Yes, it does work extremely well because obviously new development apartments, a lot of landlords already furnish these properties. So, you know, to try a new development apartment off a landlord is relatively easy. Because remember, when you're running the service accommodation unit, you're going to have a cleaner in there every day. So the one thing you should be hitting home to that all is that we're going to be looking after your property as if, as if it's almost like a show home. The kitchen is going to be cleaned every day. The cook is going to be cleaned every day. Everything's going to be cleaned. Now it's going to have brand new linen. And so why wouldn't that landlord do that property? Now, uh, Ramesh has asked a question about the 90-day rule, uh, Carol. Oh yeah, the 90 day rule. Um, the way you can get around that is because some of my contractors have stayed for six or seven months. Um, if they take holiday within that time, which obviously everybody who works does, so on average somebody will take at least a week's holiday. Um, 
once every three months. So the 90-day rule can start, a brand new 90-day rule after that week's holiday has been changed. Alternatively, um, as in my situation, you can always move them into one of your other apartments for a week. Okay, fine, fine. Now, um, Jay has asked a question on the properties that are encumbered, or do the landlords not mind if they break their mortgage terms and conditions? Now, by, now, Jay, first of all, thank you very much for your question. Second of all, they're not breaking their mortgage T's and C's because if you're running on a management contract, it's exactly the same contract as if a letting agency was managing the property on their behalf. Now, obviously, if you're running on a lease, then yes, you probably would, if they've got a mortgage, be breaking the terms of conditions. So by running it on a management agreement, you're not. So, uh, Rebecca Paul, um, 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 right, Rebecca Paul, I live in Kent and start, do you help in this? Yes, Rebecca, what first thing that we'll be doing is that on the day we'll be showing you how to search for properties. And then more importantly, we'll be going through that whole process and we'll need everyone to bring an iPad or a laptop with them because we'll be everyone will be researching their gold mine area. So first thing that we'll be doing looking at is what kind of rents are looking in that location, next thing uh, that landlords are charging, next thing that we'll be doing is looking at what kind of room rates people are charging, and then we'll be working on the worst case scenario. Of between 30 and 40 percent occupancy area, but we'll start looking at what is your break even point. We'll be looking at the demand in that location, not only as a HMO, but also as a service accommodation unit. But we've got a lot to cover, so yes, the answer is yes, we can help. And Carol, now here's a great question yeah. for you Is there yeah. a rough capital amount that they need to start on this? Um, no, not really. Um, you can certainly start on a fair, fairly shoestring because um, you're initially, first of all, you'd negotiate with your landlord as you would rent to rent. Uh, Hi, Mr. Landlord, I'd like to have the first month's rent free, please, because I need to get people in there, da 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 da. Same as, you know, to get yourself organised. And uh, then your next biggest um, expense would be furniture. Now, um, on, on the course, I can provide uh, the names of three or four furniture suppliers who work nationwide um, who will lease the furniture to you or um, kind of uh, buy on a higher purchase basis, whatever you want. So you wouldn't have to lay out, um, you, you know, maybe two or three thousand pounds or whatever on furniture all in one hit at the beginning. If you didn't have it, you could wait for a while until you were in a bit of profit first and just be paying for the furniture. As an expense, as, as an expense, as you go along, really. But that's all. That's all part of the system that Carol's got in place. Yeah. Now, Sam and Sports, uh, Manchester is more of a corporate let area than touristy. That's perfect, Sam. Because guess what, guys? Corporate lets are fantastic because you don't need to worry about people checking in, checking out. You know, if they they book the room out for a week. If they book the place out for a week, even better. They book it out for a month, fantastic. If they book it out for 18 months, even bread, you know, fantastic. So corporate clients are great. So Mike has asked a couple of questions. He goes, would you send letters to HMO landlords? Yes, that's one way of sourcing them. And, you know, that's one way of finding uh, rent to rent deals. Uh, what's the most effective way to find landlords? I think we've just, there's, you know, we've, I've got, there are a number of ways as to how to attract landlords. Every day we're attracting landlords in a new way, shape, or form. So that's one. That'll be one of the areas that we cover on the day. Um, and so I think we've pretty much covered first time ever, Carol. I think we've covered every single question that's come in. Um, oh, that's good then. <laughs> it is, or is it, 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 uh, there should be more people uh, asking more questions, maybe. There are, but no. But regardless. Um, Guys, all I can say is that if you are interested and you do want to have a chat or you want to uh, go through it, you know, I'm going to be available for the next 20, 20 minutes or so. More than welcome to give me a quick call on my mobile. Um, or alternatively, if you want, we'll be seeing you on the 29th of October in Birmingham. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hopefully you've taken away a lot of knowledge on service convention. Hopefully it's given you some food for thought. But on that note, if there aren't any other questions, I suppose the only thing that we can say is good night. Hopefully you enjoyed it and um, feel free to give me a call. Carol, have you enjoyed it? 
Yeah, it's been brilliant. Thank you, everybody, everybody for being on board. Um, anybody is welcome to contact me as well. Um, I can be quite easily found on Facebook, um, or if anyone wants to talk to me directly, um, Ash will give you my phone number or email address or whatever if you want. But it's been great, and looking forward to seeing you all on the 29th, because we've got lots and lots of more information to share with you. Perfect. All right. On that note, guys, take care. Good night. God bless. Good night, everybody.